little late today, but, uh, you know, we're here. We're going to do some match studies today. Today's going to focus on a little bit more of submissions in MMA. Um, so I'm going to start with Steven Kozlo, and I'm going to be setting the stuff up here uh, just because, like I said, I'm running late. Um, so bear with me for a moment, and I'll get all this stuff going and shared, and then we'll get started. So quarantine tip number two or one, I don't know. I don't know how many I've given you guys. Um, Oreos and coffee are fucking delightful. One second. So if you're not dunking Oreos in your coffee every once in a while, you're not fucking living. So that is my recommendation for today. Get yourselves a nice coffee and some Oreos and enjoy. I'm drinking a Peruvian coffee today from Wicked Warrior Coffee. You can get it below here at nogination.com. Um, there we go. And now we're set. You can also get this mug from nogynation.com. As you can tell, I have a odd obsession with Baby Yoda. And the coffee is fantastic. So go get yourself some coffee, some rash guards, some Baby Yoda stuff at nogynation.com. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up our first match. It's going to be Steven Kozlo in his second pro MMA win. So Kozlo asked me to put this on, and I was all about it because Kozlo is one of the best up and coming. I think he's a 125er. I know he grapples heavier. He grapples at like 145, but he's one of the best up and coming MMA fighters in the U.S. He's 3 0 now. Uh, I think all three are by submission. And he reminds me of a Diaz brother with better kicking and wrestling. So. We're not going to do the whole fight. I'm going to show you the beginning where he lands some nice strikes, some nice body kicks, and then the end where he's landing vicious ground and pound and forces his opponent to turtle, and then he takes a triangle. So that's what we're going to do now. And here. So beginning. Full screen. There we go. So look at his boxing and his stance. It really reminds me of like Nate Diaz. He's he walks his partner opponents down. He's very loose with his punches. Come on. But he throws these really nice teep kicks to the body as well. Southpaw, look at that teep kick. He lands a couple of those. And it really starts taking the toll on your opponent's gas tank. You know, um, there's a bad shot, but he ends up getting in tight here on a shot in a second, right on the cage, snatches that single. And then the rest of this is kind of working from the clinch until he gets the takedown. There are a couple of nice opportunities where he lands knees that I want to show real quick. Nice underhook pulling him into the knee. And that's something that we don't see enough of in MMA, in my opinion, is you don't see enough people pulling your partners into the knee with that underhook. So that's really nice. And he ends up switching this into a double and getting the takedown here eventually. But I'm going to fast forward until close to the end of the fight where he's starting to land some ground and pound. We're going to start in the open guard. I'm going to show off some vicious ground and pound. And we're going to show off some guard passing too, okay? So they put him back in the open guard, and look at the barrage of ground and pound he's about to put on his opponents. He starts standing up, starts throwing big shots, heavy shots. And then look at how he's going to change this right away into a guard pass. And also look at his hip positioning. His hips are always forward. He's keeping good pressure on his opponent. Once he's got him down, he doesn't want to let him up. His arm bar clears the foot right away and throws – Hammer fists, heavy hammer fists, heavy. Fucking 
brutal. And this guy doesn't get fucking tired. He starts landing really heavy elbows here, too. Plus, you know, it's fun to teabag your opponent. Here comes some heavy fucking elbows. And this forces your opponent to turtle. Once his opponent turtles, he starts sliding in for a triangle. He's going to step over and now throw that right leg around the neck, shoots through for a triangle, and then look at this perfect angle. He's completely looking in that ear. He's got full compression on the neck. He's hamstring curling, and he puts his opponent out here. And then cool as a cucumber. Walks it off, my man, Stephen Coslow. So let's go back and look at that setup for that triangle. So he goes from this north-south teabag right into some strong elbows on the right side. Two, three, four, five, six. This guy doesn't like it. It forces him to move. Stephen steps over for a sloppy mount, right? Hooks the arm with his left leg, and then he's going to slide through with his right leg. Cuts that angle, pulling down on the, the back of the shin. Really strong angle. And now he just slow squeezes, starts pulling the head. The guy tries to fall to his side to relieve some pressure. Doesn't work. One more time. Look at that step over, okay? Let me see if I can pause it. Stepping over. Now, this right leg, I know it's kind of hard to see from this angle, is going to shoot around the head. Boom. Falls back. Killer. Kozlo's a brown belt under Brian Brown down at 10th Planet Jacksonville. 3-0 and as a pro. He just won last weekend on Combat Night MMA, the uh, event without a crowd. And I got to say, props to Combat Night, one, for keeping the fights going. And two, from what I saw last night, they're going to be the reason why we still get to see Khabib versus Tony. Because Dana is talking to Mitch from Combat Night and going to use their setup and their venues for uh, no, stand, no fans in the stands uh, event for the Khabib and Tony card. So shout out to Combat Night. Shout out to Stephen Coslow. He's a killer. I uh, can't wait to see him in the UFC again. Oreos with your coffee. All right. Moving on. Minowa man. So let me open this bad boy up real quick. Minowa man is a legend in Japanese MMA. He is... Kind of like a Sakuraba because he's known for his durability, known for his submission skills, known for taking on people way bigger than him. And he always does it in an exciting fashion. If you look at his record, he's got like 67 wins. I think he's got like 20 losses or something like that. He comes from a catch combat wrestling style background. And he's going to hit a super nasty modified ankle lock. I always called it the pro wrestling ankle lock that not a lot of people use. First off, look at that fucking giant. I miss IGF because they used to put on some crazy fucking fights. And this is middle of man style here. He <laughs> walks around with his hands down. Dances, shoots crazy takedowns. So from here, look at the control he's having over the legs. And look how his opponent's kind of putting it in horrible positions. When you look for omoplatas and arm bars and stuff like that, you are susceptible to getting leg locked of your own. So just be aware of that. And check out how he starts setting this up. So he wraps the ankle. He's going to start looking for a standing ankle lock. And he's kind of using it to control the laying ground and pound as well. (sighs) 
He's going to power knee cut through the middle here. Good ground and pound. Look at how he splits the middle and comes through. And now he rotates from this pro wrestling ankle lock position to a knee bend ankle lock. Okay. And tonight in class, I'll show you guys how to do this. I'll show you how to do it in a safer manner too. But look from here, his left knee hits the mat. His right knee comes on the other side. So he's got knees on either side of the leg and he's going to rotate the foot and he can finish like a Ric Flair style ankle lock by leaning back. But what he chooses to do is over rotate into a knee bend and an ankle lock at the same time. Left knee in the mat, right knee to the mat. He can finish here, but he rotates again. And let's pause there just so we can see how nasty that knee looks. Okay, good, not good, fuck, right there. Look, his knee is going the opposite direction that it's supposed to. Anyone that tells me that knee bends don't work needs to watch this, okay? Um, I will concede that knee bends are not the most um, high percentage, but there is a time and a place for it, okay? When you combine it with ankle lock control and start twisting in the knee and the hip, a lot of times you get some really nasty tears. So if you're not studying this old school Japanese shoot style, you're missing out on a lot of like dirty techniques that we don't really, that kind of got lost in the transition to modern day leg locks, especially for MMA. Standing ankle, start sliding through. It's going to rotate all the way to the mat, rotate to his opposite hip, twist the knee, attacks the power ankle. Oh shit, did I just break your knee? I'm sorry. Walks off. Minimum man, old school legend. Now, Another old school legend. I'm going to take you guys through one of my favorite matches of all time, okay? Um, I don't think you can get the finish, but there was this guy back in the day. So you have to know kind of like the history of some Japanese MMA because all of us know who Imanari is. Um, so Masakazu Imanari you know, if you don't aren't uh, aren't familiar with him, go watch him on the last Combat Jiu Jitsu Worlds. Um, Takafumi Hanai. Now I gotta fucking find it. He started in a old school. Um, they called it combat wrestling in Japan. And honestly, the guys that I learned leg locks by watching were a lot of um, the MNRs of the world. Man, I might not be able to find this fucking match. They might have taken it down. Okay, so if I can't find it, I have a separate one here. There's this guy named Takafumi Hanai, okay? He is basically Imanari, but lesser known. And they actually had a couple matches. Man, where is it? I'm going to play his highlight of um, this is from ADCC, I believe. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe this is the one. This is a highlight of all Japan combat wrestling and the Japanese trials where Takafumi and I was leg locking people like crazy. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put that up on the screen. And 
and let you guys go through it while I try to find the actual ma match. All right, here we go. Now, the interesting thing about Takafumi Hanai is he hits a lot of victor rolls and these rolling entries to the leg locks. You know, everyone just assumes Aminari was the only one to do that in Japan, but it was a very Japanese style to go flying into these leg lock submissions. You know, he's got a very good Kimura game. Look, this is from 2005, and he's utilizing straight-up Kimura traps. Look at this. Kimura rolls him over, follows through, takes the back, transitions to an arm bar. Now, I'm not trying to shit on the Avalon brothers because I fucking love them. They popularized the Kimura trap. But people have been doing Kimura traps for fucking generations. Look at that transition to an Omoplata too. This is all in 2005, okay? This is shit that would look good today on EBI. Man, they might have took that one down. Maybe it's in this highlight. We'll just watch this highlight for now. Rolling through Kimura's legs. This one isn't going to be as much of like a breakdown as it is. Just look at how awesome this guy is and nobody knows about. These 2005 ADCC trials were insane. He murdered everybody. Rolls through to this position we saw yesterday in the Jeff Glover match. Attacks the toe hold. And notice how he's crisscrossing his feet instead of triangling his legs. It keeps his, his feet safe. Nasty toe hold. I actually spoke to this guy a couple years ago because I was trying to get him to come in do a seminar or something, but uh, he's got really bad asthma now and does not do anything with combat sports because of it. He had to stop competing, had to stop a whole bunch of stuff because of his asthma. Bam, back roll right into this knee bar position. Again, this position we saw yesterday in the Jeff Glover match, everything is fucking cyclical, you know? That Jeff Glover match was from, like, 2014. This is from 2005. This is 15 years ago. And people are rolling into leg locks, spinning through. I think you see Shinya Aoki over there in the background. Hmm. I remember this match. This is a good one. He fucks with this guy so hard. He starts doing uh, like a capoeira dance, and this guy won't do anything. Man, if you ever want to learn how to like fuck with an opponent, go watch some old school Japanese MMA, Japanese wrestling. Like, you guys think Emil Fisher is fucking fucking with people hard? This stuff is next level. And then he goes on to fucking submit him with like an Oma plot, I believe. All right, let's move into the stuff that's not a dance. All right, so his opponent got him down, bottom side, just chilling. Jiu Jitsu and chill. Looking for his own, comes up, passes the guard, right into an Americana attack. Steps through again, looks for the leg.
Kimuras, Kimura traps. Boom. Power Kimura now. Turns into a straight arm lock. <laughs> and continues to dance. Oh, Jesus Christ. Takafumi Hanai was fucking next level. We'll go into some Imanari matches. I couldn't find the one that I wanted, but we'll go into some Imanari matches here in a second. But if you want to do some studying on your own time, go watch some Takafumi Hanai. He is fucking old school. So let's look at Imanari, some of his older matches. In MMA. Oh, yeah, I forgot he submitted Ben Eddie recently. Let's look old school matches. Here we go. This one's fucking old. This is like 12 years old. It's got to be fucking insane. Well, not insane, but it's it's a real testament to somebody's ability to um, use effective techniques to be able to compete when you're still older in the game, you know. And we just saw Imanari do really well, made it to the, the quarterfinals of Combat Jiu-Jitsu Worlds. And uh, he's like 45, you know. So – that's just a testament to because after a while, we all lose our athletic abilities, okay? We lose our athleticism. We use our speed, lose our speed. The last thing to go is strength, okay? But in jiu-jitsu, strength obviously isn't everything. But uh, if you can keep clean technique and outwork and outthink your partners technically, then you can still compete at a high level, even into an older age. And I find that really amazing about Imanari. And here he is in his old shoot fighting days. Cool thing about Imanari is he fought open-handed, bare fist. And this is Marcus Aurelio. Marcus Aurelio was a fucking savage back in the day. Looking for Gogo Platas, Oma Platas, flying into leg locks. I guess this is the one, one of the ones where he had gloves on. Oh, I know. Aurelio had gloves, but this guy didn't. Switches it to inside heel hooks from 50-50. Still rolling through. Switching to toe holds. Man. The one thing about Imanari was he was always kind of a little bit of a dick, especially when he was younger. Now he seems super chill. But uh, he would crank on submissions longer and longer. And I think this was uh, one of the best two out of threes in this one. Catches the kick, rolls right into a fucking leg entanglement. Outside heel hooks, switches to a knee bar and to a toe hold. Back to the knee bar. Now he's in honey hole, throws a couple strikes. Top side knee bar for the finish. I could watch fucking Imanari all day, and I have before. And it's not just his leg locks. It's his unorthodox entries to submissions. I th honestly think his, his triangle omoplata game is better than his leg lock game. Like, he's known for his leg lock game, but he's just as crazy with his other entries. God. Let's look at that last one one more time. This guy comes in with a kick and he rolls right in. And the one where Marcus Aurelio threw the fucking head kick and he caught it, that was pretty insane too. Let me see if I can find that one. He catches the kick. Yeah. No, Siri, I'm not fucking talking to you. Right into that fucking entanglement. Fuck, my cursor was on there. Let's do that one again. Look, catches this fucking kick. Rolls right in. Man, I can watch 
old school Japanese MMA for fucking days and days and days. And honestly, this is what I've been doing with a lot of my time, just going back and watching old matches. If you're not keeping your mind going and thinking during this time, you're going to come back slower. And let's talk about that for a second here. Look, if you don't keep your mind active when you can't keep your body active, I'm going to show some of these comments as I do this. <laughs> Stevenson's joking around. Shout out to Luis Ojeda. Good guy. My man, Tom Scully. Yeah, you're old as dirt, dude. Yeah, unpredictability is, is a huge thing. Let's talk about that in a second. But if you're not keeping your mind going during these times, you're not going to come back anywhere near where you were when you left training, okay? We're all on an even playing ground. Most of us are not training, and those of us who are aren't getting in good training, you know? Like, I'm boxing, and I'm – drilling with my wife. I know a couple of people that live with some roommates so they can do some drilling, but if you're working from home, you can't really fucking grapple hard. You know, you don't want to destroy your fucking walls unless you're in a place you don't really give a shit about. But anyways, the biggest thing is keeping your mind active. If you can keep your mind active, you're going to be able to come back with retained technique or retained technique and new ideas that you can play with in your training. So that's why I find tape study so important, you know, even when I would, even when I'm not being quarantined and shit like that, I'm constantly watching tape. I think that's one of the things that turned me from like an okay instructor into a good instructor. You know, it turned me from an okay grappler to a good grappler because there there's connections between visualization and success in that area. This is like visualizing but you get to watch it, you know? So if you're watching a lot of tape, the, the process I go through is I'll watch a lot of tape and then I'll, I'll close my eyes and I'll try to visualize it. And then I'll think about what makes the technique work and think about those key details that I need to work on and really focus in on the minutia of, like we're talking about controlling the joints above, the joint below and the joint you're attacking and what angle should I apply where is my breaking pressure coming from? What is my main uh, source of control? All that stuff is something I'm thinking about when I'm visualizing, when I'm doing my mental reps, okay? Yeah, it's not as good as doing physical reps for some of us, but mental reps play a role as well. So when you're sitting here with this time off, because everybody thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, it's going to be more than that. But with this time off, go back. All these fights are free on YouTube, you know? The UFC is putting out a bunch of free content because nobody – they're not they are not putting anything on. So they're putting a bunch of free content out there. I've been watching like old school UFC fights, the best knockouts, best submissions, best heavyweight fights, all that stuff for a couple of days now for free. Go watch that. Think about it. Go back, watch the old ADCCs. They're on YouTube. Go back, watch the first couple of EBIs also on YouTube. A bunch of Polaris's are on YouTube. I mean, go do some research on Japanese combat wrestling. There were some great guys that came out of the combat wrestling scene. Go look at that. Go look at the, the Russian Sambo. Go look at Judo. There's, a, there's a, uh, an infinite amount of content on the internet right now. If you're bored at home and you're not doing something productive and you want to make improvements in your grappling, go watch some of that stuff. All right? It doesn't just have to be gi jiu-jitsu. It doesn't have to be no gi jiu-jitsu. Go into some Greco, freestyle, folk style, judo. There's fucking – if you want to, like, look at some really good judo, go check out the Mongolian judo program. That They're awesome. Um, so, yeah, use your time wisely, guys, because it sucks, but when else are you going to have all this time to yourself? All this time to do what you want to do. Start coming up with ideas, whether it's training, it's business, any of that stuff. Use this time wisely because it might not come back again. All right, I'll be back today at 5 p.m. with my firearms instructor, Billy Tudko from Tudko Tactical, and Nick Norton from Liberty Ammunitions. We're going to do a podcast on how to defend your home, basically, okay? And uh, Billy's going to do some safety tips as well as maybe some drills that you can do at home. I know, personally, I've been doing a lot of dry fire drills just because 
we don't want to waste our ammo right now. You know, this is this is the time when you need it. So, um, yep, tune in 5 p.m. We got Billy Teco from Teco Tactical. And then at 7 p.m., I will be going live for classes, and we can talk about some of the stuff we saw today, the unorthodox leg locks and uh, unorthodox entries. Entries might be a little tough. Unless I go to the school, I'll talk to Jenna when she gets home and figure that out. But, uh, yeah, stay safe, guys. Suck 1% less every day. Be a little bit less of a piece of shit than you were yesterday. Get yourself some coffee, some Baby Yoda stuff. This is the only way I'm making money right now. Down at nogeenation.com. We also got Baby Yoda rash guards, the Star-Lord rash guards, and the Fuck the ABJDF rash guards. And I'm going to be announcing the charity we're going to be donating to in April in the next couple of days. So, peace, guys.